It is interesting in a, a sort of a new phenomenon that we have in Christianity in which it is such a common practice when you look at churches online that one of the first things that you, you see on a web page is the dress attire at the church website. Churches want to make sure that you feel comfortable when you come into a church. Because if people are planning on dressing, they want to know what is acceptable to wear. If by chance I come to your church, is it okay to wear a tie or do I need to wear a jacket? The last thing a visitor wants to do is feel embarrassed because they have underdressed or maybe they feel that they have overdressed for the occasion. But there should be a larger question at stake. And hardly have I ever seen this. How should a Christian conduct themselves when they come to church? More importantly, how should Christians conduct themselves out in the world? This seems to be something that Christians have forgotten about. Or perhaps we just need to be a refresher course. What's the standard? What is socially acceptable? Or more importantly, what is acceptable to God? Should everything be tolerated? Paul makes the case that Christians can no longer conduct themselves as Gentiles do because we have not so learned Christ. I want to take you back to Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 17 through 19, Remember that the Apostle Paul says, I testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk. Remember that in the first three verses here, he's saying don't walk like this because it leads to futility. Your minds are going to be darkened. Your hearts are going to be hardened. The end is away from God. And the bottom line is, because you have believed into Christ, and I want to recall that all those that he's talking to in Ephesians, he has heard about their faith. So they are believers. And if you go back in the book of Acts, you find out that Paul spent a good two years with these believers. And in Acts chapter 20, when he left, they were hugging and crying and tears were flowing. When the Apostle Paul left, he made an impact upon them. In verse 20, he says, But you have not learned Christ, and if deed you have heard Him and you have been taught in Him, and the truth is in Jesus. There's something different about Christians. And Paul's making a a nice divide between those who are followers of Christ and those who aren't. And that difference should be like taking off old clothes and putting on new clothes. I really appreciate the bulletin and the cover. This is the best thing that I could find. That's one of the points that are in there. But what Carolyn found in the bulletin for this, this is great. Because it it pictures the idea of putting on and taking off. And that's exactly what Paul is using in his words when he says in verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct. There are some things in the Christian conduct that is no longer valuable, no longer valid for the Christian to be doing. So stop doing it. And there are some things that the Christians haven't been doing it is time to start doing. So he says, put on. Like you all put on shirts today or dresses or something. Put those things on. You have to be active. You have to take advantage. You have to do that. No one's doing it for you. I don't see any little kids in here, so your mommies don't dress you anymore. You've got to do that. Paul continues with the same idea in verse 25. He says, therefore, putting away. In other words, therefore, taking off. He states the code of conduct for Christians. And by stating the code of conduct, he's basically saying it's time to exchange vice for virtue. It's time for us as Christians, as believers, that we exchange those old vices that we have that have been kicking around that are part of our life. Maybe we don't know any better, but it's time that we recognize them for what they are. They are vices. And we need to exchange them for Christian virtues. And this morning we're going to, we're going to examine five of, of the code of conducts that we need to make and you need to apply to your life. So the first one, the first code of conduct. 
needs to move from lying to speaking the truth. In verse 25, it says, Put away lying. Therefore, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. The vice. It's simple to see the vice. And you can write these things down. The vice is lying. Falsehoods in general. You can lie by not saying anything. You can lie by allowing something to be said, which you know is incorrect. You can lie with a look. You can lie by not fulfilling a claim. There are many ways we can spend our time talking about what is a lie and what isn't a lie. Our society is filled with them. And perhaps when you go into your small groups today, in your life groups, you can talk about all the varieties of lying that there is. From the flat out, isn't it interesting we have degrees of lie? From the flat out, just the big lie to the white lie. We call it a less harmful lie. It's still a lie. Paul says, the first thing we need to do is we need to take off lying. That's the vice. Because once you start lying, and you lie, and you lie, it becomes part of your nature, part of your habit. So stop doing it. You boast and you brag, you're lying. I'm the greatest game player in the world. You're lying. I make X amount of money, and I've got, do you? Well, if it's not true, you're lying. If it is true, you're prideful. Paul says, stop this. It's interesting that he chooses lying as his first thing. Because in that ancient world, and even in our world, how often when we talk to people, we have to kind of read between the lines. What are you really telling me? How much of this is just garbage? Where's the truth? The virtue to put on is speaking the truth. Why does Paul start with this? Hmm. Perhaps because of deceit and the corruption of the heart. He knows that it's so well and sits in the seat of so many of us. So we are to put off and not associate any longer with the sinfulness of lying, but instead we are to speak the truth because back, remember back up in verse 21, as the truth is in Jesus. John chapter 14, 6, verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are to speak the truth because Jesus is the truth. Jesus spoke the truth as the truth that is in Jesus. God says he cannot lie. Oh, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, Titus reminds us, God is not a liar. God only speaks truth. You mean all the time? All the time. Doesn't he ever fibble? Look, no. What comes from God's mouth is truth. You never have to wonder, did he exaggerate? No. It's this and only this. So you know where you stand. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God, dear children. So he's telling us, make sure that you stop lying and you speak the truth. Why should we do this? Because our Father is one who speaks the truth. And He only speaks the truth. And as children in a relationship to Him, we are to imitate our parents. We are to imitate our Father. We are to imitate the one that we have a relationship to. Where do children learn how to lie? Where do children learn how to pick up phrases and words? It might seem cute when they say stuff. But all it is is a reflection of the sinful, desi- the sinful heart that they inherited from you. And it's your job to correct that. And we might say, I'm trying to correct that, but are you doing anything to correct it in your own heart? As Paul goes through each of these, he says, look, there's a vice, there's a virtue, but he also identifies as a reason. And there's a reason for this. 
And the reason is that we are members of the body of Christ. Here he says, for you are members of one another. Why shouldn't we lie? Well, yes, because it reflects to, the, to because God is our Father, but also it says because we're members of one another. How can we interact, how can we minister to one another if we're constantly lying to one another? But if, we're bought, if we recognize that we are the body of Christ, for as the body is one and has many members, but all are members of one body, being many we are one body, so also is Christ. The person who lies as a regular part of his or her daily life is demonstrating whose character? Which body do they belong to? Not to the Lord's. Jesus, when he's talking to the leaders, he says, you're of the, talking to the Pharisees, he says, you're of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the very beginning. So we are to put on truth. How can I go to my father and intercede for you and pray for you if you don't tell me the truth? Part of speaking the truth requires a certain amount of intimacy. Hmm. It means love has to flow. Right? In order for truth to really work, there has to be love is that connecting bond. It's the... It's what holds everything together. So the first code is we've got to stop lying. And instead, we've got to learn to start speaking the truth because we belong to one another. We are Christ's body. We have not learned to speak lying from our Father. We have learned to speak the truth. And that needs to be reflected in what we say and how we say it. The second code of conduct. We need to move from unrighteous anger to righteous anger. In verse 26, he says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Right off the bat here says vice. Here's the vice. Unrighteous anger. I am surprised that more and more people I come in contact with, anger is a huge, huge problem. Huh. The vice of unrighteous anger, he's quoting Psalm verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, and the Hebrew verb means to shake with rage. Anger is always vindictive. It's selfish. And there's no place for it in the Christian life. The word Paul uses here can have a negative or a positive meaning. He says, do not be anger. or or be angry but do not sin is that idea there. But he's saying, look, so don't be angry, or if you're going to be angry, but make sure it doesn't lead to sin. If you're going to be angry, so you got the picture of a person who's shaking. They're so mad, they're shaking. But don't sin. The vice is when you're shaking and it leads to action. It's all about you. The virtue, on the other hand, is righteous anger. Is there any place where righteous anger is justified? Turn to Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to take you to a few passages because sometimes people are just shocked by the fact that Jesus got angry. Mark chapter 3. Take a look at a few of these things. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus is healing somebody on the Sabbath day. That's on Saturday. And you're not supposed to do any work on Saturday. If you go to the doctors and the doctor gives you an ointment, he worked and he's in trouble because he did, he did labor. So they're looking at, a, a, if Jesus is God, he's doing a miracle, that's work. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they're not looking at, oh, wait a minute, if he's God and he's doing work, uh, isn't he outside of his own regu- out of his own rules and so forth and so on? But we, we, have a, we have a bigger problem than just he's doing work on the Sabbath. So in verse 5 it says, And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said, 
to the man, stretch out your hand. So Jesus is looking at the people that are around him, and then he heals this man who has a withered hand. Verse 6 says that the Pharisees went out, and immediately they plotted with the Herodians against him and how they might kill him. Jesus is mad because here's a man who's in great need, and they're irritated because he's going to heal him. This is righteous anger, doing the right thing. And these people say, we don't want you to do the right thing. This isn't the only place. Go to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, verse 15. Jesus has just healed a woman from her infirmities. And Jesus said, and then the Lord answered them and said, You hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loosen his ox or donkey from the stall and lead him away to the water? So ought not this woman, being the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 14 years be loosened from the bond, this bond on the Sabbath? Here Jesus is calling them, you are a bunch of hypocrites. He's angry with them, but he has not sinned. We should be angry at the evil that we see around us. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the failure to react with indignation and anger against sin and evil is always a sign of moral, moral decadence and godlessness and irreligion. I think that's where we're at. We are afraid to be angry at the wrong because we think that makes us wrong. But we do have to stop being angry at things that we shouldn't be angry at. We shouldn't be angry when our kid comes home and blow up and explode because they didn't take out the garbage or our spouse didn't do something right, or the guy cuts us off in the freeway, and we lose our mind. And we're ready to crash into them or pull out a gun and do something horrible. You know, or somebody cuts us off line in the, in the grocery store. Those things, that's the wrong kind of anger. What's the reason? Paul lays out some good reasons and good, good things for us. He says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't harbor anger. Either, either way, give it an appropriate, because it gives the opportunity for Satan to take the truth and destroy the believer in the process. Anger opens a door to your heart to nurture grievances. You may want to chew on injustices or replay the images of wrong in your mind, unkind thoughts, words, or actions. Haven't you done that? You're angry if someone has done something and you replay that issue over and over in your mind? The point is we are not to give place to the devil. Do not give him an opportunity. Peter says in chapter, uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, says the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he's to devour. James says we are to resist the devil. Paul's saying, look, don't give him opportunity. And the opportunity is when you're angry. Because when you tend to be angry, you can't hear well. You don't listen well, and you don't take any wisdom or advice from anybody. And you need to deal with your anger in an appropriate time, and that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Look, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I heard one couple say, we took that advice as a married couple, so we'd stay up all night fighting. That's not the point of it. The point is, set some sort of time frame. Deal with the issue. Even if you can't deal with the the other person, you need to deal with it and say, Lord, I'm giving this over to you. I'm dropping it to you. I've settled it because of the blood of Christ. And wait a minute, Lord. You have forgiven me, so I am not going to forgive this person. And I'm going to let go of it right now. Now, whether it's righteous anger or unrighteous anger, either one of those, you've got to deal with it because if you don't, it's going to lead to bitterness. You're going to hold on to this. And it's not your place or my place to judge. That belongs to God and Him alone. He's the only one righteousness to deal with it. 
And so when these emotional things come up, we need to recognize it and deal with it. The third code of conduct. We need to move from stealing to sharing. Verse 28 says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. I love this idea. Each one of these codes I think we could take a whole Sunday just dealing with and talking about. But the vice is stealing. Stealing is wrong in all of its forms. Whether you're padding the expenses, reporting more hours than you actually worked, cheating the IRS out of the money that you supposedly made but you didn't, or vice versa, doing personal business on company time, you know, surfing the internet. Nobody's ever done that. Shoplifting. Keeping, what the, keeping more money when the clerk overpays you, you go, oh, that's a bonus. No. That's stealing. Not paying a fair wage if you're an employer, you know it's fair. What would you want to be paid? Not paying your debts. The Greek word for stealing is klepto. Does that sound familiar? Kleptomania? Yeah. They just take? I just want to... I'm amazed. When I worked in retail, the biggest theft that we had were people that we employed. The people that we employed were our biggest thieves. Not the people from the outside who were shopping, but the people who worked for us. Because you start feeling like, I'm owed something. I'm working hard, but they're not going to mind if I steal, if I take this or take that. And then I was always blown away that our shoplifters weren't the dirty, vagrant-looking people. Sometimes they were the people that wore a suit and tie. They didn't need it. They just liked to take stuff. The thrill of it. We had a couple, a little old man, a little old lady that would come in, and they would steal like there's no tomorrow. Had jewelry on. They looked nice. You'd never expect it. But they, would, they were professional thieves. Hmm. Interesting. The vice is you need to stop stealing. Many of us take things that don't belong to us. And we rationalize it and pretty soon we think but we're owed it. Because we've done so much other things. The virtue. The virtue is not work. Although we could say working is what is so important. There is something honorable about work. In the very beginning, God issued that man should work. Mankind should work. That's an honorable thing. I don't care if you're flopping burgers at McDonald's or you're working for Google. It doesn't matter what job you're doing, doing something, working is an honorable thing. But the virtue is sharing. Paul is laying out here and explains why he worked. In Acts chapter 20, verse 33 to 35, and you can look at this later, Paul states, he says, while I was with you in Ephesus, I worked. I didn't re- rely on you people to support, my, support me or the people with me. Remember, Paul was a tent maker, and he must have been pretty good at it because he was a, made enough money to provide for his own living and for those who were with him. And on top of that, Paul explains why he did this so he could have money to give, so he could share. Now, sometimes people did give money to help in the ministry. But his main thing was that he might be able to pull from his pocket and give to others. That was the key thing in which he wanted to be able to do. Believers are to work. In Ephesians chapter 4, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, if you're not working, then you shouldn't be eating. You got that weird feeling in your stomach that causes you to have some pain. That will motivate you to work. Working is not going standing on the street saying, I've got three children. I just need something. No. That's called the hustle. We see a larger, larger proportion of people who are out there looking and begging for stuff. I've seen time and time again where I've seen people hop out of the back of a pickup truck. 
and they spread all out with empty gas cans saying they need money for gas. And then they all get back in together in the same vehicle and they take off after they've collected enough money. I've worked with other churches who have gone through and fed the homeless in the streets of Oakland. And time and time again, you find out the, the homeless are there because they want to be, not because economics. Not because of a whole veracity of other reasons. Now, there are some, I'm sure, but the way you find out about them is making a relationship. Not by handing $5 out of your window as they're standing there. Because guess what? You're going to see them next week and the next week. And if you look around, you're going to find meals and all, a whole bunch of other stuff that's there. The key thing is, and you look around, there are jobs galore in our area. This is a standard for all believers to work. As the Apostle Paul is saying in verse 28, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. This is good. It is good for us to work, to, do, to have a job. It is bad for us to sit back and do nothing. This is what is... I'm going to get on a soapbox for just a second. It is bad for men, especially men, not to do something. This is why unemployment is so bad for men. It reduces us to where we feel that we are not adding to the value of our home and to our family. It's nice to be pulling a check, but men feel more valuable when they accomplish something, when they do something with their hands. And young, young people, I will tell you the same thing. You need to get in the habit of doing some sort of work. If you st get stuck playing video games all your life, you're going to be living with your mom and dad until you're 40 or 50 doing the same thing. You need to be doing work. Young ladies, you need to be doing some work too. I'm just telling you from experience. I worked my whole life. The Apostle Paul says you need to work, not so that you can have a nice car, not so you can have a nice big house, but so you can give, so you have the opportunity to help people who are in need. Yeah, that's right. That's just not handing out and giving money away. That's knowing who needs help. You saw missionaries up on the board, the lambs. They're doing a great job. They're doing a great work. We have a lot of missionaries. These are worthwhile people to give to. Friends of Israel. Good, play, good people to give money to. You find out people who are doing a great work, and those are the ones you give money to. All right, enough of that. I've already mentioned the reason that we want to be able to be a blessing and sharing it's not to gain wealth, but as Christ said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. That's true. Fourth code. From destructive words to constructive words. In verse 29, let no, let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth, but what is good and necessary, edif edification, building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. The vice, unwholesome words. When we think of unwholesome words, think of that which is rotten, corrupt, worthless. The type of talk or speech that spreads rottenness. You've heard the phrase, one bad apple spoils the whole barrel. That's true. A toxic attitude just creates toxicity everywhere. James says the tongue is a fire. David prayed for his mouth in Psalm 148. Lord, help me control my mouth. That should be a prayer that maybe some of us should be doing. Lord, help me control my mouth because I'm critical. I'm cynical. Things fly out. The mouth speaks out of what is filled with the heart. It reveals the wickedness of what's inside of us. When we get angry, we say mean, nasty things. Then we turn around and we say, we didn't mean it. Like that somehow magically erases everything. But it doesn't. It came from the foulness of our heart. The only way to clean the heart is with the Word of God. With God's truth. 
which is honorable, which is just, which is pure, which is lovely, which speaks of good reports, which is worthy of praise. If you want your mouth to start speaking things that are of virtue, uplifting words, then you've got to fill your heart with God's truth so that when you become angry, it's not horrible things that are coming out. Wicked things. Because when we get angry and those things start coming out, it's revealing of really who we really are. You say, but I've been a Christian for a number of years. I get that. But when, that just, when you just exploded on somebody, that really is who you are right then and there. Doesn't sound so good, does it? Should cause us to be humbled. I don't care if you're a deacon or a pastor or, who, or whoever you are. When that happens, it's time for a heart check. We need to build up with words, edifying. Building up has that idea instead of deconstruction, deconstruction, it's constructive words. That's what a coach will do to you sometimes, or a counselor, or a personal trainer, sometimes a boss or a spouse, maybe a friend. They'll use suitable words for the occasion. I want to ask you to turn to the book of Proverbs real quick. Go left in your Bibles. Find Proverbs chapter 15. 23. We're just going to go to a couple of these because as Solomon, the wisest man, as he put this together, he wrote, he, he grabbed some great truth. In chapter 15, verse 23, he says, A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in, in due season, how good it is. That builds up. When you say the right thing at the right time, how encouraging is that? I've seen that done in people. I've seen a guy or a gal say something to another person and their whole countenance change. Go to chapter 24. Chapter 24, 26. And he who gives the right answer kisses the lips. Isn't that beautiful? When you give the right answer, it's like a kiss on the lips. Chapter 25. Let's see which one I wrote down on here. Verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Huh. That's that idea of building up using the right words. What's the reason? Our connection, our conduct, our connection with one, each other is how we communicate and we talk to one another, but our conduct can grieve the Holy Spirit. Remember that His role in our life is to be a comforter. He's coming alongside to help. How discouraging it is to help somebody who is constantly taking, not taking the right action, who is constantly destructive when you're trying to build up and give the right truth to the person, trying to help a person, and they're not making the effort. And we as believers say, don't, don't discourage. Don't discourage the Holy Spirit. You're thinking, how can that be possible? You mean the way we act, the way we behave? We can grieve Him? I didn't think that... That shows the personality of the third person of the Trinity. That shows there's a relationship that's going on between what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life and my life and Him. That shows that there's a caring between Him and us. He's seeking our best and wanting to see that transpire. And you and I, by the way, that the words that we're using, they're grieving Him. It's hurting His heart. Hmm. 
let me run through our next one, our fifth one. Our fifth code of conduct is the moving from natural attitudes to supernatural attitudes. These, are, these sinful uh, attitudes find their expression in our speech. The vice is the natural attitudes. These are easy to see. Verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Bitterness is resentment, irritability. It keeps a person in constant animosity. We live in a day and age where we can see bitterness better than any other time in our lifetime. I've never seen a society, perhaps, I haven't lived long enough, that could be the reason, but after a political uh, election swing, we've got half of our country that is in complete bitterness over an election. And I'm, not, I'm using that as my illustration. People are just flat out bitter by the results of an election. Well, four years, it's going to change. Another four years, it's probably going to change again. But the bitterness, the animosity that's still there, the resentment, that's bitterness. And holding on to that creates a root like a tree root. And it seeps in and holds on. And fruit comes about that. There's that rage. It means outburst of anger. It's wild. It's explosive. It's like you just sit down by someone and they just, why are you sitting here? Why are you even here? You're bothering me. Uh, I'm breathing. You're interfering with, uh, I was just watching TV. Okay, that's rage. Maybe, maybe that's you. Then this anger is orge. It's a little different than what we had before. It means smoldering. It's subtle. It's deep feeling. And then that clamor is that shouting and yelling. It's that concert where people are yelling at each other nonstop. And slander is where we get our word blaspheme. It's to defame another person, saying something that's harmful about them or to them. And then, of course, malice is ill will, wicked desires with respect to others, determined to do them harm. And Paul says, put the stuff away from you. Being a Christian does not mean that this will automatically drop off from you. These bad attitudes. And Paul says, don't pray them away. He's not asking, Lord, please help these vices to go away by tomorrow. Instead, he says, put them off. It's unpleasant to face these attitudes. But we must, and we must hurl them away from us. We must recognize that these are attitudes that many of us in this room have. And we must take them off and we must throw them down and say, enough, I am done with them. And instead, we must pick up the supernatural attitudes that are here before us. And God has provided the positive reemplacement as we remove the negative attitudes. It's not to leave a void. Instead, we turn and God says, I have supernatural attitudes as you are following me Put these on because these will replace these negative attitudes. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And in doing so, he says, it's not simply to be kind, but become kind. There's a process of being kind. It takes time, effort, and opportunity, and you have to give attention to it. A kind person looks for something he or she can do to praise another person, to help others, to carry the load, to make the sour sweet, to solve problems. It's a kind person. It takes effort. And be tenderhearted. Previously, we're told in verse 19 that those who be in past feeling, that's that callousness, and now we are to be tenderhearted. We are to be sympathetic, compassionate, have a loving nature, feeling for others, be aware of the needs of others, be sensitive. Oh, that's just how they always are. Ah, who cares what they're doing? No, it's, how can we help them? What can we do to come alongside and help? How can I minister to them? That's my brother or sister and they're hurting. How can I reduce or take some of the pain away? 
And in doing so, the third one is be forgiving one another. Realize that people sin. Realize Christians sin. They do wrong. They may wrong you. Forgive them. Christians sin and they may wrong you. You have to forgive them. Forgiving is realizing the full wrong that has been done to you and then forgiving them. Forgiving is a characteristic of God. It's an action of grace. The word actually comes from, the bigger word comes from the Greek word of grace. Forgiveness can only be done when you are walking with Christ. The only way you can forgive somebody when they sin against you is if you are walking hand in hand with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, not, you cannot forgive somebody. Oh, you can mouth the words, but you can't do it in your heart. So I ask you, what's the reason for this? Even as God in Christ forgave you. There's the reason. There's the standard. Christ forgave you. When you sinned against Him, He forgave you. He recognized the sin, the penalty which was going to cause His death, and He had to go to the cross and die. So that He might restore the relationship. When you, someone sins against you, do you recognize that it's destroying the relationship? Will you apply the blood of Christ to that sin and forgive that person so that you might have a relationship? And in doing so, Christ says, I'm not going to remember that sin. I'm going to forget it. I'm not going to say I forgive you and then bring it up next time I get angry at you. I'm forgiving you. I'm forgetting it. And I'm treating you like you've never sinned against me. Huh. Wow. Like you are my co-heir. Can you do that? You've been given a new code of conduct. A new, new, app, new opportunity to walk with new clothing. This is stuff that we need to put into practice this week. And we need to keep practicing throughout the rest of our Christian life. We will hear these things again and again as we get into the book of Philippians or Colossians or Romans. And we will hear them in Thessalonians as Paul hits back and forth again on these same things. Because the conduct of the Christian will always point the unbeliever to Christ. Is your conduct pointing people to Christ? Take an inventory of that. I'm going to ask the, uh, our ensemble team as, as they come up. As they come up and get ready to sing our song, would you join me as we pray? Let me follow, Lord. Have you spoken to hearts this morning where we ask that you would Answer that great question for us. Is my conduct pointing people to Christ? I ask, Lord, that you would help each of us to walk worthy of the calling which you've called us to be your sons and daughters. That we would imitate you in which we could bring you honor and glory. We thank you, Lord, for loving and caring for each of us. And throughout this upcoming week, we might put off the old vices that want to cling to us. And Lord, that we would make the effort and put on the new virtues that you've laid out for us. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.